Well, it's good to have you joining with us today, friends. We welcome you in the Saviour's precious and worthy name. You can see on the desk here in the study, I've put out some pen knives that I've collected over the years. And ever since I've been a little boy, I've always been interested in pen knives. My father was the same before me, and maybe that's where I picked up this interest. This is some of a collection that I've gathered up over the years, and each knife is significant, and there's a wee bit of history and a wee bit of a story behind quite a few of them. And the word pen knife is mentioned in the Bible, so after we talk briefly about some of these knives, we're going to go to the scriptures and see what the Bible has to say about pen knives and what the lesson is that we can learn from them. So I'm just going to flip this camera around, so be prepared for a wee bit of movie magic here as we just quickly change the position of the camera. <clears throat> well, there we are, folks. Good to see you uh, face to face. So as we said, over the years, we've collected a few pen knives together. This little blue one here is probably the oldest in my collection. It's a little Swiss Army knife, and there are two famous Swiss Army knife manufacturers. I think one's gone out of business, Wenger, and then uh, Victorinox is the other one. This little knife here belonged to my father, and I'm sure it's well over 40 uh, years old. And he was given, uh, he was given it by uh, people from Norway who were involved in providing machinery for the place where my father worked. And I remember seeing this knife for the first time Probably it was about four or five years of age, if even that, and just amazed by all of the little, uh, all of the little tools on it. There's a pair of scissors, and there's a saw, and there's a there's a can opener, and there's a screwdriver, and there's a corkscrew, and there's a toothpick, and all sorts of different things. And the little Wenger, uh, Swiss Army knife, probably from about 1980 or something like that. So it's brave age, and it stood well. The test of time. And then here's another one that I was given once as a present by a very good friend and it's quite a big one. It's got a pair of pliers in it. Um, nice wee pair of pliers. It's got scissors. It's got a magnifying glass. It's got a fish descaler. It's got a hacksaw. It's got a wood saw. It's got two blades there. Um, can opener again. Um, bottle opener. Toothpick tweezers, mini screwdriver, corkscrew, uh, and all for making holes and things, and a few other things as well. So that's a nice little knife as well. There's just another wee Swiss Army knife. Usually use that one quite a bit. Stays in the drawer here in the study. Uh, what else have we? This little knife here, picked this up whenever I was about 16 years of age, a shop in Lisburn called Guns and Tackle. And whenever I was studying engineering at Tech, the, uh, one of the teachers, the electrician, uh, taught us about electrics and how to wire things up. And he says, go down to the shop and get yourself a good pen knife for cutting the, the plastic off the wires. So that's the wee knife I picked up then. And a uh, good quality knife made in Italy. And I've had that for many years as well. Uh, another personal favourite, this Stockman knife. My father and I, many years ago, went to California for a holiday just after he took early retirement and I remember just going into a shop, I think it was in a place called Half Moon Bay in California, buying this knife for my dad and uh, he thought it was very special. So it's just a little Stockman knife made by Schrad, an old timer, and it's uh, made in the USA. So there's a couple of those. Um, buck knives, you might have heard of buck knives. We're going to talk about those again at another time. Got this little knife here again, it's made in the USA, very high quality. Uh, picked this up in Westport, I think it was, in the Republic of Ireland, one time in our holidays. And again, it's another little favorite. Uh, this brand, it's made uh, from bone handles, uh, good quality stainless steel, made in Germany, Boker. And again, that's a, a traditional knife. It's uh, known as a trapper, it's got the two blades there. And uh, don't use that one so much, that's more like a, a wee collector's item. Um, here's another knife I picked up once in a place in Lisburn, gone many years ago, J.C. Patterson's, and they had a good selection of knives. I like this one because it reminded me of a switchblade, 
and it's got a very fancy locking mechanism on it. And again, never really used it, but just thought it was a nice uh, little pen knife. What else have we here? Oh yeah, this is one that I keep in my pencil case in the study. And again, it's a Boker, a German brand, a Trapper. Two blades on it there, and it's got bone handles, and it's a lovely little pen knife, and that stays in my Tony Hawk pencil case here in the study. And whenever we moved house, and we had lots and lots of boxes to unpack, this was the little knife that was used to uh, open all of those boxes. And then one I got more recently, uh, a Gerber. It looks like an old uh, cutthroat razor, so it's more of a modern design on an old style razor, and you can sort of uh, you can flick it out like that there. So there we are, folks. A few pen knives for you, and I don't know if you are interested in that sort of thing yourself. But pen knives are mentioned in the Word of God, in the Book of Jeremiah, chapter thirty-six. God spoke to Jeremiah and told Jeremiah to write down everything that the Lord said to him in a book. And so a friend of his, a man called Barak, the son of Neriah, uh, wrote from the mouth of Jeremiah all the words of the Lord, which he had spoken unto him upon a roll in a book. And this book gets read in the company of God's people, and then in the company of members of the state, and then at last in the company of the king. And the king at that time did not like what was read to him from the book that Jeremiah had written. It was the word of God. It was read in the presence of the king. And the king Jehoiakim, the king of Judah, was angry whenever the word of God was read to him. He didn't like what he heard, read from the book or read from the scroll. So what he did was he took, the Bible says, a pen knife. And he began to cut out the bits of the book that he didn't like and threw them into the fire and he burned them. And we read about that in verse number 23 of the chapter. And it came to pass when Jehudai had read three or four leaves, he cut it with the pen knife and cast it into the fire that was on the hearth until the roll was consumed in the fire that was on the hearth. And so he just slowly but surely took the pen knife to the word of God and began to cut out the little bits that he didn't like and threw them into the fire. And it wasn't long before he had used his pen knife to cut away everything in the word of God until the book was burned completely. And there's a very real and valuable lesson for us in our day and in our generation regarding that. It used to be taken for granted in the churches and to a very large degree in the nation that the word of God was special. It was described as once being the secret of England's greatness. And the word of God was reverenced in Parliament and in palaces. And the word of God was reverenced as well in the pulpits. But you know, over the years, people, oftentimes in high places, have come to despise the word of God. And it's like they take their pen knife and they cut out the bits that they don't like. And there's so much of the word of God that the natural man despises within his heart. We think of the Ten Commandments. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. No longer is that the case. People have cut that out and destroyed that part of the word of God as they see it. And then the sanctity of marriage is another thing. And sins that the word of God condemns. We're living in a society where people have taken a pen knife to the word of God and are cutting it out. Uh, even in high places and no longer does the word of God the Bible have its place in our society that it used to have and then even in the churches and the evangelical churches I personally use only the authorized version of the scriptures because many of the modern versions are based on manuscripts that have been corrupted in many respects but the old authorized version is based on what is known as the Textus Receptus, the received text that is solid and authentic and uh, reliable. Many of the modern translations are based on West Cotton Hort's manuscripts, which are tampered with in many respects. And if you compare the old authorized version to many of the modern Bible versions, for example, the NIV or the Good News Bible, or the Living Bible, and compare it and contrast it, you will discover that many of the modern versions 
There are verses that have been cut out from them, many of them critical verses whenever it comes to the theology of the Christian faith. And so that's something that's worth looking at and that's something worth studying. But even on a personal level, sometimes we almost cut parts of the word of God out from our minds and from our hearts. Even thus, those of us who are fundamental, evangelical, Bible-believing Christians, we maybe skip over the minor prophets or the law of God in the Old Testament, and we read the Psalms and we read the lovely promises of God in the New Testament from Philippians chapter 4 and different places like that, and it's so encouraging and so blessed, and it's very important, of course, to do that, but not to neglect other parts of the Word of God that maybe challenge us, maybe call for our devotion, our obedience, our consecration. We can so easily be like that king in Jeremiah chapter 36 and we take the penknife and be cut out parts of the word of God that are unpalatable to us. Leonard Ravenhill said, this book is either absolute or it's obsolete. And either we receive with meekness all of the engrafted word that is able to save our souls or we don't receive it at all. It's either absolute or it's obsolete. And furthermore, right at the end of the book of Revelation, chapter 22, verse number 19, a curse is pronounced upon those who remove anything from the prophecy of this book. So it's a solemn thing as we think about some of these pen knives. It reminds us, Jeremiah 36, about that king who didn't like what he read in the word cut it out, tried to burn it, tried to destroy it, but in fact was really destroying himself. God bless you. Thank you for joining us. And we hope to see you again very soon. God bless. Bye-bye.